Go. Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to the college complexes tonight. This is a free speech forum. And uh, we have three rules. One fool at a time, no personal attacks. What's the third one, Jim? The, we'll refer to the above two. Refer to the above two. Keep it civil and uh, don't try to talk over somebody that's yes, talking, especially because this is set up for Zoom. So we have a couple of good speakers tonight. Uh, it should be a very interesting program. Okay, thank you. Through the format. The announcements and then oh, yeah, the, the format is uh, we have announcements, then we have the speakers for about <laughs> we have a uh, question and answer period, and then we'll have the rebuttal period, uh, last 45 minutes or so. And the college will go off the air at quarter to eight, right? And for those of you on Zoom, you might want to continue, but this restaurant closes at eight, so we have to start wrapping up before quarter to eight. Thank you all for coming. Okay, we'll, we'll see you later. All right. Who, uh, okay, uh, Charlie, you want to start with the announcements? All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,704 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Yeah, As we, always, we, yeah. I will serve notice that we have two email groups, which I recommend you subscribe to. We have a Google group and a meetup group. And there's not much traffic on either one, but you will receive an email update uh, as to the upcoming program that week and the college <laughs> complexes. Uh, before we begin, uh, please yeah. everyone mute your button there on the screen. If you are viewing remotely, uh, because it picks up noise, we don't want to interrupt our speakers, at least during the presentation, keep it on X over the microphone. And I must request those in, in attendance in person. We do pick up chatter. So please, if you could, in deference to our speakers who have important things to say, uh, please, refrain at least during the presentation from uh chatter and comments because it is picked up uh by our equipment thank you very much yeah. now i know i am not a capitalist i will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs on february the 25th our own professor lichtenberg he's been working on this Bear with me, Charlie. I'm getting the share screen up in a second. Whatever. Thank I'll you. proceed. Nevertheless, on the 25th, thank you. Um, uh, next week, we're going to discuss the philosophy of love. That's L-O-V-E. Many facets, a topic we have not covered here at the college. Uh, should be an interesting program. Uh, because there's just thinking about it, romantic love, love of country, love of money, all manifestations, I guess, love of travel. All right, Charlie, I'm trying, I'm coming right now to get the right damn thing up here. Sorry about that. Can yeah, you, you want to get maybe March now. No, okay, well, we've got February. There, there's Bob Lichtenberg following month. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Transitioning into March, we man, we've got some good stuff coming up. An International Women's Day. We got special speaker. Rise up for abortion rights. They're very excited about coming and speaking to the college. Been working rather assiduously on their presentation, so it should be a good overview of the topic. Whatever your views are regarding it. Okay, that's on March the fourth. <laughs> On March the 11th, a group which has not been here before, the Community Renewal Society, which is involved in all Whatever. sorts of minority issues, and an activist. That's only about the uh, president here. Please, uh, Jake, we're we're uh, we're on presentation Sorry. now. Sorry. Uh, March um, March the 11th is the Community Renewal Society. 
Uh, why do we have a big blank thing on the screen? I don't know. Uh, uh, March 18th. That better, Charlie? Yes. Now let's go to March 18th, if you would please, sir. On March 18th, uh, I see he's here tonight in attendance. Mr. Perez will be giving us a discussion on social media, ownership and, and monitoring and control and, and uh, regarding uh, media outlets uh, that has been a very uh, controversial topic of late. So uh, censorship in that manner. So on March 18th should be a good program, uh, generate a lot of discussion. On March the 25th, uh, it has not been solidly booked, but uh, I'm waiting last word confirmation by an organization called Nuke Watch, N-U-K-E-W-A-T-C-H. Nuke Watch, so come back and refer back. I should confirm it on Monday. Uh, this is a pacifist organization regarding the threat of nuclear annihilation. Another good program. I've just posted this. I've started preparations for April. In April, we sometimes run one or more programs in conjunction with Earth Day. So if you are concerned about ecological issues <coughs> uh, or climate change or, or know of an organization that would like to present, we sometimes just have a series of programs. Uh, we definitely are going to have one on April 22nd. I'm claiming that spot for the Illinois Green Party, the most outstanding uh, ecological organization in the state of Illinois in deference to the Sierra Club and others who also do good work. But uh, if you'd like to present uh, any, yourself or your organization that you're affiliated with, please contact me with a title and uh, uh, a brief description of the presentation. Um, one last thing, we have two sites I recommend you check. Uh, we have our archival library of videos in which you can see last week's program uh, that Timothy Bulger maintains with the recording of the programs, our lecture library. Now, in addition to that as well, there is a uh, another listing, a, a uh, archives of PowerPoints and films referenced by speakers. Some of just of general interest. Uh, see the little guy there watching? Could you bring that up, Tim? Free films online. There you go. And you can see those are the PowerPoint slides from last week's presentation, which were quite detailed. The ones that I, I, hopefully I'll be able to get them up there. But anyhow, that's basically it. If you'd like to get on the schedule, we've got all those dates in April that are open, regardless of topic. So thank you very much. Take it away, Tim. Okay, there we go. Uh, we had somebody log in from the restaurant and uh, we had to, um, you know, like I said, you're hearing the echo right now. They got to mute their speakers and their uh, microphone when they're on on Zoom, especially in the restaurant. Otherwise, you're going to be hearing an echo all night. Okay, um, who's uh, who's okay? Let's get our speakers involved. And uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Get up there, and we'll start our our speech. You want to mute your? Okay, go ahead. No, that's all right. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, this is good spot. I think be behind it, behind the chairs or in front. You can sit down. Why don't you just sit down on them, like 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 you do in a normal, like you would do in a right talk in a, show. Yeah, like in a talk show, and then that way you can just right. go right, right between you guys. See, we'll see up there. I'll stop the share and uh, you see, you see the echo. You can hear it, Mar uh, Margaret, on the. Uh, on. You need to get your speakers. Yeah, let me get. I, I can't All see right. myself, but I can see all of y'all. Okay, well. All right, let's welcome our speaker. Yay. Let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, a little more, a little more. Right, right up against the bar. And then that way we can see both of you real well. Okay. 
Well, go ahead, guys. I'll start the presentation, and when you're ready, we'll get going here. So, go ahead. Go ahead and launch it. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for in inviting Paul Cohane and myself. I'm Tim Milburn. We got in invited from uh, Charles. We recording presentation. Oh, maybe six, seven weeks ago for the Northwest Suburban uh, Organizing for Action Group, and he, I think, liked what he heard, so he's invited us to speak here tonight. Um, Go ahead and bring up the first slide, please. Okay, we're doing that now. So um, we are uh, kind of collaborating as members of Sierra Club. Um, I've been on a volunteer for the last 10 years, been very involved in clean energy legislation, including clean transportation, renewable energy, and those are some of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, and I also have a clean transportation business uh, that I operate out of my home in Park Ridge. I get involved with electric vehicle charging systems uh, for buildings and for residents and for municipalities. Uh, I'm also on uh, the steering committee for the U.S. Department of Energy's Clean Cities program here in Chicago. And I'm also very active as a program advisor for the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus for EVs. Again, for EVs and EV charging, we're working on a program for getting municipalities ready for the growth in EV charging. So, uh, I also want to just give a little background on what we're going to talk about. Um, this is a little different than just uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act or CJA. We're going to talk about that in some depth. But since this got going, where uh, people like Paul and myself, we, we were kind of asked to be called, they called the CJA, CJA ambassadors. So CJA being the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. It's gotten bigger. There's a whole bunch of federal programs that speak to the same issues, provide incentives and programs, and we're going to talk about kind of that whole range and how it fits into potentially what you could do individually or collectively or as businesses, et cetera. Uh, so uh, kind of the premises of all the programs we're going to talk about are they address climate change, uh, they create jobs, and they address equity issues. So that's kind of the focus of all of these things. And so what are the policies and the opportunities? Uh, that's what we're going to get in, into. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Colhane. So let's see if there's some. Yeah. Paul Colhane, uh, Professor Emeritus, yeah. say a retiree at Northern Illinois University, political science and public administration department. I'm on the Northwest Cook Group of the Sierra Club Executive Committee and also the Director Emeritus of the Alliance for Great Lakes. And number two now. Okay, so what we're going to do, as Tim said, is we're going to cover some background on the history of CJA, which is a long history, uh, and then go into the very detailed uh, policies uh, that are part of this Clean and Equitable Jobs Act. Um, there's an outline. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I have to go back one. Sorry. Um, so basically, um, go back one. Yeah. I also got to back up too. So, yeah, basically, um, the CJ is an equitable job that your components. One little footnote if you're looking at the description of the program, it says Clean Equitable Jobs Act 2019. So now that typo snuck in there. We are falling up. So, uh, but it's actually from 2021. And the eight major areas are very detailed. Um, it's a little complex. So we're going to try and simplify it a little bit and focus on what we think are the three most relevant ones and then how the individual can participate and benefit in these incentive programs. And then we can get into the question and answer. Okay, okay now I'm ready to move. Okay, so in September 2021, CJA passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. Uh, and then there are some parallel statutes at the federal level that we're going to cover as well. Uh, but I do have to mention that this is the latest in a number of very important bills. Uh, we had a, a renewable portfolio standard, and I have to mention that because one of my good doctoral students did a dissertation over a decade ago on uh, the renewable portfolio standards program. It showed that Illinois program was in the top of that tier in his analysis. And 
then the renewable portfolio standard. After that, the Future Energy Jobs uh, Act okay. of 2016. And uh, that was very important. That we're going to see some of the goals of lowering renewable, uh, increasing renewable energy are part of uh, each of those bills. And as the slide says, there are tons and tons of organized meeting and other and please be quiet and will the speaker please use the microphone a little louder please thank you oh it's closer yeah okay uh so Oh, okay. All right. So these are the eight major components of CJA. There are substantial elements of CJA that have to do with providing jobs and economic justice areas. Uh, refine some of that because of this carbon-free power is related. Uh, just transition for fossil fuel communities is carbon free then there's places in parts of Illinois that have been uh, doing coal mining and so forth and those communities need that transition financing energy efficiency utility accountability transportation electrification um, Tim's going to be telling us a lot about EV which is a major component of this bill so these are all very complex very good but it would take us from now until midnight to go over all eight elements. So what we've decided to do is that we're going to focus on the three elements that we think are most relevant here in the Chicago land area, which is renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, and transportation electrification. Um, now, there's parts of Illinois, like I say, that have um, relied on fossil fuel for over the years. And for those parts of the state, this just transition isn't the most important, but for us here in Illinois, uh, we think that those are the three that are most worth focusing on uh, tonight. Okay. Um, CJ right. has some major investments in various things. $82 million a year on workforce development, contractor equity programs. It's a major focus on the Equitable Jobs Act component of this uh, bill. $41 million is an investment for fossil fuel communities and uh, former communities. That's the thus transition element of CJ. The biggest number that you'll see right here, $380 million investment in new renewable energy. So we're going to be talking about those elements in particular a lot to see. The goals, 100% carbon-free power in two decades, right? Two and a half decades. That's a major uh, objective. By 2040, 50% of the energy in Illinois should be renewable. That's a major objective as well. We'll show a chart in just a minute on that. And a million electric vehicles the end of this decade. So again, another major progression in making a dent in the warming that we have experienced in World War. Uh, and equity is at the center of all this. 40% of the benefits are supposed to uh, help out um, communities that have had equity, equity problems over decades and decades. Okay, let's go on to the next one. These equitable, equity eligible communities, there's two definitions of this. Environmental justice communities are those that are, have a higher risk of pollution and health effects because they have been uh, based on, or they've been subjected to pollution over the years. And the other are the R3, or the restore, reinvest, and renew areas. These communities have been harmed by violence. On, Fortunately, you may not see it at the bottom of no, it. It's, it. it's, it's, it's defined by 
uh, the cannabis law. So this is not something that Seja invented. These are state communities, but it's a major focus on um, the equity elements. And you can see a little bit here on the, the map. A lot of these are in Chicago, but not exclusively in You just stay there if you want. Just stay right there. I got you. Um, so the next three slides are going to, it's kind of a comparison of the state program and two federal programs. A lot of detail on here. I'm not going to read it all. Um, if you get the chance when we get this on your site, you can kind of get into this. But this, this is basically kind of a summary at a high level of what's in this bill. So it's a 960 page bill. The stuff in green is more or less the environmental slash greenhouse gas reduction components. We're, we're going to talk about renewables, transportation, energy efficiency, as Paul mentioned. Uh, but there are other things going on. And this is just sort of a summary of those things. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to introduce at this point the bipartisan infrastructure law. Some people refer it to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or IJA. I'm going to use the bill. Um, and that's basically, we've all heard about it, the bipartisan infrastructure. It's a national level program to beef up United States infrastructure. And there's, you know, it gets into drinking and wastewater and environmental remediation. Broadband, you know, getting it out into rural areas, western water problems. We're going to focus more on the green areas here, which is well, transportation, power, and energy. Um, so, again, I'm not going to read through all these, but this gives you a sense of how this program works. And it's, I'm going to kind of pull out the elements in the three areas we've been talking about. Uh, next one, please. And then, if you will, a sister program, the Inflation Reduction Act, which just came out last August. Um, it's it's a um, tax credit based program, and it, it talks to opportunities to uh, get tax breaks on EVs and chargers and uh, renewable energy. We'll go into that, uh, but it's basically a program to control spending. There's provisions to establish tax fairness. You've heard the president talk about taxing the rich. Um, there's there's a Medicare and healthcare reduction. We're not going to talk about that. There's also deficit reduction and inflation reduction intended in the program. Um, the other two that will come in is there are some of the jobs programs relate to the programs here and the equity, uh, the Justice 40 program, which we'll talk about. It also overlays on kind of everything in here. So, again, this is just sort of a resource to give you a snapshot of the program. Uh, next, please. And this is just introducing for those who have heard of Justice 40. So it's a federal it's an executive order that basically say, well, we're investing in communities. We want to be uh, taking 40% of the available funds and employing it to some of those um, environmental justice communities and other disadvantaged communities. And, and I want to be clear on that. That's not necessarily saying we're giving them 40% of the funds. Uh, a big part of that is, is a living strategy so that you can have the ability, if you're a minority or a disadvantaged uh, or community, you can take advantage of the program to get uh, good findings and with favorable terms. So uh, this is something that gets overlaid at the state level as well, some kind of a philosophy. Um, over on the right, there's just a bunch of links you can go to. Federal programs has programs that may be parts of the Justice 40, that may be parts of the, of, uh, the DIL or the IRA, uh, but they're basically these links will take you to what those particular departments are doing in the world of uh, climate change in particular and other programs. So there's, uh, in the last couple of years, I mean, there are literally hundreds of programs. We're not going to go through it all, but uh, this gives you some direction in some of those based on these areas. Uh, next slide, please. As we get it here. Right? Oh, shoot. No, it's, 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 Can you hit that? it's giving, yeah, there we go. So I wanted to just paint the picture because I, I was like, uh, when I first got into this uh, a couple of years ago now, 
I was like, well, what's going on in the rest of the world and how does what they're doing in, in you know in Europe or wherever uh, relate to this? And so uh, for those of you who are familiar, I'm sure everybody's heard of the Paris Agreement, which uh, was which is the top 26 at this time. It's the Conference of the Parties, which is driven by the International Panel on Climate Change. The whole goal is to get everybody thinking the same way on climate. Um, what I've seen is basically the precepts, the ideas, the goals here are getting passed down to U.S. federal level through these bills, and they're getting passed down into CEJA, and it also ends up being passed down into some local programs, which we'll talk about. So there is, um, in looking through this, the underlying goals, objectives, programs, it's, it, there is definitely a flow. They're targeting the same thing. Climate change reduction through better energy use, uh, equity. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of nice to see that it actually is being thought of, if you will, from the top down. Hard work is down here at the lower levels. This is where, you know, people like us have to take advantage of it. We have to take action to do these things. But uh, basically, um, you know, this is, this is kind of the flow I wanted to present that real quick. <laughs> So um, next, as Paul was saying, I've been saying we're going to focus on these three pillars: calling renewables, energy efficiency, and transportation electrification. So just of those eight, we're going to focus on the three. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. All right. Next slide. As I referred to before, we're going to, I'm going to talk about renewable energy. Go to the next slide. Um, under the Future Energy Jobs Act from almost a decade ago by now. The goal was to get to 25%. Okay, and that would have been this green line over here. EJA is trying to get us on this blue line here. Huge increase in renewables. And uh, so prior to CJA, the state had a goal to reach 25% by 2025. Uh, our biggest renewable energy share comes from solar and wind here in Illinois. Uh, other, you know, hydroelectric and geothermal are also renewable. Um, and geothermal is an excellent additional alternative. With CJA, this goal was increased to 50% renewable generation by 2040. And the important thing is that CJA creates financial incentives for wind and solar development. And the level of incentive depends on how much electricity the particular project produces over 15 years and what that project is. Um, CJA also creates, so these three programs at the top, small rooftop solar, uh, large rooftop solar, community solar, those had all existed previously. Uh, CJA creates three new programs, carbon free, free schools, solar programs. This is a specific program focused on getting solar on schools. Uh, community driven community solar, um, new, and then the equity eligible contractor solar program. So these are new solar programs that's created by uh, CJA. Um, community solar is a good program. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, I have to confess as somebody who has rooftop solar, um, I'm a real fan of that. And for those people who can install rooftop solar and are interested, the current incentives, the current incentives for going with rooftop solar are great. They're spectacular. There's three major elements of the incentives. One, the federal investment tax credit. So if you spend um, $10,000 on a solar project, you get $3,000 federal tax credit the next year after you do the installation. The state solar renewable energy credits, SREX or solar Rex is sort of the jargon in the business, but these are based on how much electricity your system will produce that can again cover 30 to 40 percent of the cost of the project and this really helps is a huge help for illinois to meet those that goal of 50 percent renewable the third is what's called utility net metering so when your solar project is going it's generating electricity if you're using 
using that to run your house, then that's going to reduce your bill. If you generate more electricity in August than you're using to run your air conditioning, the electrons go back into ComEd, your ComEd system, and you get a credit for that. And that credit rolls over in subsequent months. And that net metering is something where your system is generating electricity, some of which you're using, some of which goes back into the grid, and you get paid for that. This Wait, one more item. Uh, oh, I snuck it in there. Oh, okay. Right back. Oh, okay. Property value, no tax assessment, but the PV uh, adds some value to your home. Um, in principle, that's what I think is the case. A realtor's tell me something a little different, but uh, I think in the future, it definitely is going to be a, a good addition to property value. Okay. Now, these are some very complicated tables. And what it's saying is that the amount of the credit that you're getting from solar racks varies by the type of project, whether it's a small, larger system. But the key thing that's very hard to see over here is that the amount of solar rec credits that you get is excellent for small solar installations. Okay? And that's probably the key point here. But as for the College of Complexes, you will probably not be surprised in knowing that the solar racks are complicated. All right. This is an example system of what installing <coughs> not a huge, but relatively average size solar system on somebody's roof is going to cost and how the credits work. The installed cost $20,800. The solar recs for this system would take off $8,022. The federal tax credit is a credit that the homeowner gets when they file their taxes, $6,240. So the net cost of this system is not $20,000, but $6,538, which is slightly over a quarter of the cost. So you're installing the system, you're getting the free electrons, you're reducing your electricity bill every month. In our case, when we installed the system, we were our monthly average, so you're averaging the winter when you're not using as much as in the summer when you're running your air conditioning. Uh, but our monthly average was about $75. Now we pay $14 a month to ComEd, and that's not for electrons, but it's for the taxes and the interconnection fee. So we're not paying ComEd for electrons. We've reduced our bill from $75 to $14. And that's how the system pays for itself. These systems will pay back with that savings in five to eight years. And then uh, for the remaining part of the 15 year or more uh, lifespan of the solar program, you've got three electrons. That's a very, very, very good deal. Okay. Before you, before you go on, I just wanted to mention what's at the bottom of the So a lot of just stay right where you're at. You can, I can yeah, a lot of people ask, okay, this sounds great. What do I do? Who do I call? Yeah. And there's a link at the bottom. It's, it's basically the Illinois Solar Energy Association. It's a link to contractors that are recommended um, that you could call and get the three quotes that are relevant. So that's, that's just something that's useful to know if you're thinking about it. And I forgot to mention another part in this checklist box over here. Uh, several things that you should do uh, beforehand is uh, having a south facing roof is best. Uh, a solar system will also work on an east or west facing roof. Uh, so if you have a beautiful big tree uh, just south of your house, then that's going to make uh, a solar system a little bit difficult. And that's actually a relevant problem to some people. Uh, you want to make sure that the home is energy efficient. Consider the condition of the roof. Uh, when you do not want to have a roof that needs to be replaced in five years and put a solar system on. You want to put the new roof on, then put the solar system on. Okay. Um, and then go back and I'm sorry, Dr. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, we got it. We'll just keep going. No, no. 
and then uh, get quotes from good contractors before you do it. Make sure you, you like your contractor. I certainly like the contractor that I hired in Palestine. Anyway, um, okay, now we can go on to the next one. Community solar is the other alternative. If you don't have the ability to put solar on the roof of your house, or if you live in a brown house that, you know, it's just not a feasible operation, uh, the other alternative is that if you don't want to put up the net $5,000 to install uh, solar. The other alternative is what's called community solar. This is an option for people who can install solar. Uh, it does uh, offer guaranteed savings. Basically, what you're doing is you have another provider who is generating the solar electricity and crediting you for the solar electrons. You're supporting provide that provider in providing renewable electricity. That's the short and dumb version of this. Okay. The typical savings are 10 to 20 percent off of your total bill. Uh, there's a link here at the bottom that's a very good one for finding out more, but uh, flip to the next slide, which is going to show what the savings is like for this hypothetical program. This electric bill here has got a total of $109 in a, in a, a month uh, for, before they install this. If you provide, if you sign on with Community Solar, you have two bills. You're going to get a bill from ComEd or whoever your provider is that's going to credit you for the solar credit. So you're paying only 59. And then you're paying the solar, community solar provider, $40. So instead of paying $109, you're only owed $99. This hypothetical example of saving $10. Now, the advantage of community solar is that you can't put solar on your house, but you just philosophically think it's very important to participate in renewable energy. This is a way you can do that by buying into community solar. There's a number of very good providers that will do this. Um, but I have to say, in my case, I say, I'm going to save more money, get a solar system, put it on your roof, and save big bucks that way. Okay. Um, Next. Yeah. Um, Solar for All is a program that is focused on low income. Uh, to be eligible for the Solar for All, you have to um, below, add or below 80% of the area median income and qualify for the Solar for All. Uh, and that's also for community solar and also for nonprofit property. Uh, there are no upfront costs, and indeed, the cost of the installation uh, cannot exceed 50% of the value of the energy generated by uh, the solar project. So, this is a way of getting a solar project, um, having the upfront costs funded, and you're still going to save 50% on the energy cost of your bill. Um, this is something, if you're interested in this, the Illinois Solar for All program is a very good website, but it's a another good alternative for communities that are below median income. Okay. Yeah. And finally, uh, CUB, Citizens Utility Board, and uh, the Midwest uh, Renewable Energy Association have a very good program to uh, inform people about how uh, buying solar will work. They host these solar power hours to educate communities about the benefits. Um, uh, the, uh, the NREA, Renewable Energy Association, manages a request for project or request for proposal process that competitively selects uh, solar installers. In other words, these are people who will help you on the technical details of doing solar. Uh, so it's a very good way of getting people to get informed, participate, sign up for further evaluation uh, for solar on their houses. Yeah, but
Uh, the other thing we have, they've been running this program for about three or four years now. And basically, if you know if you wanted or you wanted you wanted to put solar on your house and you went through this program, it's a group buy, and you end up saving on the order of five to ten percent on the total install cost of what it would have been if you just gone out for a single bid. And it's it has it's right now it's not active, but they've been you know they don't do much in the winter. So come the spring, they typically open the program. Oh. Good segue. So I'm going to go into on renewable energy, what's going on in the federal bills, as I you know kind of previewed. Again, the bipartisan infrastructure of all focuses on large scale uh, stuff. So they're they're looking at things like grid investments. They want to improve the transmission lines and the you know, power plants, renewable utility scale power, uh, less so for residential uh, applications. Um, there's also something called the production tax. So we were talking about investment tax credit, which means if you invest in something, you can take some percentage of your taxes. Production tax credit means if you put up a wind farm or a solar farm, you get paid based on production. So you produce so many kilowatt or megawatts, uh, you'll get a credit uh, basically after you've done that production. Uh, and they basically increase the amount of money available, which draws investors into large scale projects. They're also focusing very hard on workforce development programs, training, there's a big minority component in there. And a the, the goal of this uh, Bipartisan infrastructure law is targeting a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas production across the country by 2030. And as I mentioned, the Justice 40 programs are, if you will, overlaid throughout all these programs. And the, the next slide is going to be about the, uh, the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is more something that will relate to all of us as individuals. Um, it's federal income tax credits, and it's basically looking to get you know clean energy at all levels. Uh, we've had a program for tax credits on solar for uh, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, those programs have been consumed or displaced by the IRA. Um, so now it's thirty percent for rooftop solar. Uh, that program, the old one, was going to go away at the end of this year, uh, but now this is, there's a 10 year runway. So this 30% is gonna run out for, for 10 more years. They've also added energy storage systems. So you can put battery packs in your basement, they can tie into your solar system. Um, and uh, this, is, this is something that's new. Energy storage is going to be a big part of this solution because if you think about it, if we're going to be at 50% renewable energy, um, the sun doesn't shine at night, as we all know. So, what are you going to do? You're going to have to store that energy during the day and use it at night. So, this is a step in that direction. Um, and they also have some kind of bonus points. If, if the energy storage you purchase has a Buy America component, there's a 10% bonus. And there's also uh, 10 percent for energy community so the uh, fossil fuel displaced communities they'll get a bonus for using uh, energy storage there's also some prevailing wage on the job site so uh, this applies to non-residential so the for a, a commercial or industrial application you're going to have to have prevailing wage uh, requirements and also uh, apprenticeship requirements so this ties into you have to make commitments to bring up people in the community through apprenticeship programs to support the jobs programs to build all these things. Um, for those that are want to get into the nitty gritty, the IRS has uh, a program for energy efficiency tax credits. Uh, so for appliances, for weatherization, for uh, insulation, um, this is there's a, a whole lot of different programs. That they list here, and then this is sort of how, how would you get how do you file for that? How do you apply for that? Um, and then the other thing that kind of came out of it after the bill was released, like municipalities and churches and other non for profits said, This does us no good, we don't pay taxes. How do we get a tax credit? So, they are right now they're supposed to maybe be out March 1st, they're going to have a new language that basically applies the same thing. 
So just be a 30% uh, rebate for not for profit. So this is a big deal for a lot of the lot of not for profits. Um, so the next one is our second pillar, the energy efficiency. Next slide. So one of the things they always call this the lower hanging fruit because it's it's easier to change out an energy consuming device to something more efficient than uh, you know to do something more serious. You, you can do it for less money. You can do it by changing behavior. So um, basically. The CEDA, the law mandates, comment has to have a 21.5% reduction in energy consumption across the board in all the generation sources in the state by 2030. And then by 2040, the number's 30.5. Uh, and Amara downstate has similar goals with lower numbers. So there's this is a kind of a, it's an aggressive program to uh, get uh, energy efficiency at the forefront. Andy, this is probably important for you. Um, and there's also they're, they're trying to help the health and safety side, uh, focus on low income and equity. So th there's a you know a lot of tiers to this, but the whole goal is to get less energy consumed. From a consumer standpoint, um, there's some pretty cool, simple programs that are available. They're available today. Uh, one is the home energy assessment. So uh, you can call Andy or you can call ComEd. Uh, Andy, you can do this, right? Okay, you were telling me you, you were involved in that. Anyway, so they'll come in and they'll walk through your house, they'll look at your thermostat, your lights, your, how your, your water heater, your furnace, and they'll give you some ideas on how to be more energy efficient. Um, and then at the same time, they have a marketplace on their website, uh, which is down here, the ComEd marketplace. And basically, well, when you do the do the home energy assessment, they give you all of this stuff. They give you a programmable thermostat and a faucet, and shower heads, and pipe insulation. They, uh, I think I got 20 new light bulbs, uh, LED light bulbs when I did it. Took about an hour and uh, showed, showed up on our bill. Um, the other thing they have is uh, they've got deals online. So if you go to the website, they, uh, you can get all sorts of things on in their catalog that all are targeting energy efficiency at a, at, at a discounted price. Next week. The other thing they're trying to do is uh, get people to be smarter about when they consume electricity. So we all know that you know on a hot summer day we're all cranking the AC up. Um, so they have a specific program during the hot season to. Uh, basically, it's a smart thermostat. It's talked to the comment. They will give you discounts if you follow the kind of the rules of this. So, if you're smart about your AC use, they also have something called hourly pricing, which basically what most people do is they pay an average rate. So, you pay, let's say, 12 cents a kilowatt hour 24 7. What this does is it's associated with the actual cost of production. So, when there's um, on a hot summer day, electricity costs five, six times what it does on an on a, on a average day. So when you're when you're under hourly pricing, your your rate reflects that for those hours of the day. So the idea is that if I know that that's the case, I'm going to try and use less electricity during those times. Um, and you can end up saving. Typically, they talk about 15 to 20 percent on your energy bill. By, uh, by using hourly prices. And then there's another, it's a similar program called Peak Time Savings, where again, they're, they're going to give you a break if you manage your electricity consumption by using it uh, smartly. Because where they pay the most is when it's the peak use. So they you end up paying more for peaks. So this allows you to reduce your peaks and they'll give you a credit for it. Um, so, want to also talk about energy efficiency and the federal. So, back to the IRA. So, this is the, that same thing I mentioned before. This is associated with, with this, is you've got tax credits associated with procurement of energy efficiency devices. It could be like I think there's $8,000 tax credit on a heat pump, um, and refrigerators have uh, big tax credits. Um, 
there's here it is energy efficiency exterior roof 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 metal roof materials uh heating and air conditioning water heater biomass scope each of these has kind of a catalog of what those credits are that you can find at these links so now we're uh, kind of getting into my day job uh, transportation electrification this is a, a, a local minister out in Arlington Heights and got a Nissan Leaf. He's very happy. Uh, next, please. And this is my home. I'm very proud of it. I have solar panels on the east side of the house. I have an EV. I charge with solar electrons when the sun's out. Um, and I've been able to get incentives for the solar, for the vehicle itself, for my EV charger. And I'm just about to put in energy storage, and uh, hopefully there's more things coming. But I, I'm kind of a, a geek about this. I like to try things out for myself. This has been, you know, fantastic. I also have used a wireless charger, like a cell phone charger, to charge my TV. So going back to CJA, the Illinois bill. As Paul said, there's a goal is to get a million electric vehicles on the road by 2030. Very ambitious. They're doing that through policy to drive people to drive EVs. Um, right now, there's a program if you buy a new EV, you can get a, a rebate from the state of Illinois for $4,000. There's a program for the EV charger that's going to be cover up to 80% of the total cost of installation of the EV. This program has not yet been released. I think it's going to be more for public EV charging than residential. Uh, we're hoping to hear like any moment now. There's a third area, it's called beneficial electrification. So the name means beneficial is it reduces the cost to the consumer, the cost of electricity, and it reduces emissions. So what they're doing is they're integrating renewable energy energy storage and EV charging into kind of one system. And now the electrons will move back and forth smartly. And by doing that, you can reduce the loads on the grid. You can reduce the actual cost to charge vehicles. You can use the sun to charge your vehicle. You can store it during the day and use it at night. You can get away from peak charges. This is a this is kind of the way of the future, but the future is uh, they're supposed to announce the program March 1st. They also created uh, an EV coordinator in Springfield that's responsible for all these programs. So what I've done here again for later use, these are the programs I just talked about, the top three, the EV rebates, the 4,000 uh, per battery EV, the 80%. These are links that go to the websites that will tell you about it. For those that prefer a, a QR code off a cell phone, those are the same links. Um, I mentioned the um, beneficial electrification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just a minute, I'll just, somebody there is not. Uh, not somebody sure. needs to be muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I got him. Hi, Richard. Yeah. Sorry about that, Richard. But we're going back now. Hang on a minute, okay? All right, go ahead. Okay, so um, I think we were moving on. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was talking about the beneficial electrification, uh, so this I didn't mention one thing. There's also called vehicle to X, which means you could exchange electrons with your vehicle battery with your home, your business, or the grid itself. You know, and uh, so rather than have a, a diesel or gasoline generator in your garage, you can use your EV to, uh, during power failures, just you know, as an example. But this is the direction the industry is heading to optimize the use of, of uh, the grid. And ComEd and the Emerald are the ones that are driving the design and the investments to do that. There's another program down here that's a little bit unique to Illinois. It's called the Reimagining Electric Vehicle Act or REV Act. Basically, uh, this passed, uh, I think, late 2021, um, and it allows businesses to set up shop in the transportation electrification field. You can be a big battery business. You could make uh, parts for under the hood for an EV. You can make EVs. You can make EV chargers. 
Uh, there's tax breaks, there's hiring uh, incentives, um, and the whole goal is Illinois wants to become kind of the Midwest center for EV and EV charging manufacturing. At the federal level, uh, the, I mentioned the fact that the bipartisan infrastructure law is kind of focused on the big picture, big plans. Um, being an EV charging business, the you know, number one thing I hear is range anxiety. You know, I don't want to get an EV because I'll run out of batteries. Well, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, or NEVI, is basically uh, it's a five-year plan, five billion dollars nationwide to set up a fast charger every 50 miles along every interstate in the country. It's basically it'll be like gasoline stations are now. And this investment provides 80% of the total installed cost of those investments. So the stations we're talking are a million dollars a pop. And so the federal government is going to pump 800 grand per station along the interstate, you know, added along the interstate. Um, and also, you know, there are already, uh, I think, 4,000 of these DC fast chargers on the interstate now. Um, but they're going to fill it out in five years. Illinois, $150 million of this to do it here, here in our town. There's a secondary program. It's called a Private Public Charging and Refueling Program. So, you know, smaller roads, communities, rural areas are going to get this funding to do the same thing. There will be smaller projects. They'll be uh, customized to fit. But this is going to fill out some of the gaps between the interstates. Um, and again, this is targeting an 80% number, and it's also going to involve compressed natural gas as an alternative fuel. Um, not going to go into this, but if somebody's interested in school buses or ferries and ports or bus facilities, there are programs specifically for that. And these are multi billion dollar buckets also. Uh, there's probably $20 billion here amongst the three of them to be spent over the next five years. So moving over to our friend, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, again, tax credits, you can get up to $7,500. You go buy a new EV, when you file your taxes, you can get up to $7,500 the next year. Um, they have Buy America criteria. So if you buy a foreign electric vehicle, you will get less of the rebate and it's going to actually become more stringent over time at some point you have no ability to get a rebate this is also running out to 2032 with a degrading scale increasing the amount of buy america as well if you make a lot of money a couple hundred thousand dollars a year as a family you won't be able to apply if the car costs i think it might be over eighty thousand dollars you won't be able to apply. The idea is that if you can afford an $80,000 car, you don't need $7,500. That's the idea. Um, they also have a credit for used electric vehicles. So uh, the EV started up in about 2009. They're, they're starting to, you know, I go online, I have a used EV, I have a 2014 Volt. I'm thinking of selling it this year. Um, I can get 30% of what I sell it for up to $4,000. Um, there's also the ability to get a credit up to $1,000 if you install an EV charger in your home. And for those that are interested, there's an IRS website that has a lot of Q&A that drills down into the particulars of applications. It's okay, you just go ahead. Okay. Keep talking. Okay. Uh, anyway, so if you're interested, this is a good way to, to build on it. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, they have introduced the ability for, or they, sorry, they're in the process of introducing that same process for not for profit, hiding out down here. So again, a municipality, a not for profit organization, you'll be able to get these same kind of tax credits. Um, uh, but it won't be it won't be a tax credit. It'll be a refund or a rebate. We're not sure. Thank you. Um, and this is just if I read these things all day long. But some people say, "Hey, this, I'm interested in learning more." Here's some links to go to. Tub's got a good book 
ComEd actually has some really good resources. Uh, this is a book which talks about the whole spectrum of EV charging decisions for local government. Um, and these are good places to look for if you want to find where your chargers are. There's one that the government does, it's called the Altera Fuel Data Center. And then there's a plug share space locator. If you're, and they're all on your smartphones or on your desk uh, smart devices. And then if you really want to get into it, this, there's a database of all the laws, federal level, state level, local level, that you can find at this point. Thank you. This is your homework. Um, I want to just throw out one more topic, and that's kind of local activities, because uh, as I started out earlier saying, a lot of the um, the reality is when you get local, the specificity of programs and how you do things. Um, and how do you engage your local community? Well, Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus is a particularly uh, a great organization that has kind of taken the lead on this. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Greenest Region Compact. Basically, it's a how to be sustainable for, for city and town. Um, it's basically, it's got a, uh, called a, it's a framework which has got 1,100 different sustainability ideas across the spectrum of sustainability, including clean transportation. The same group also organized a climate action plan, which is a multi year plan to make the region. To, say, or sorry, to attack the problem of climate action, including methods of mitigation and, um, and resilience. There's a program that's been around for a bit called Soul Smart. It basically trains municipalities on how to do permitting and inspection and get their people up to speed so that it's faster for people to install and get approved. We're now working on a program called EV Readiness, which does the same thing for EV charging. I'm actually uh, managing this program with the Mayor's Caucus. There's another program called the VW Trust Fund. Some of you have heard of VW teaming on their mission. They had to give basically 15 million with a B dollars to uh, a trust company to distribute. Uh, Illinois ended up with $108 million of that. I think about a third were followed. Uh, and I mean, uh, technically, uh, they want you guys to throw out the garbage, but I can do that. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, yeah, I got to stick around anyway, so yeah, you don't have to. Oh, are the where are the um? Are they right out that side though, the dumpsters, or do they know where? Yeah, it's uh, oh, it's on that far side of the, the little circle drive. Okay. Drive I can't. Uh, and they'll the probably. Time. I think they said they were going to haul the haul okay. their trash out, but uh, you know, as long as it's I not. I have no like, idea who's. Okay, yeah, I didn't know what the norm was. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's taken me a moment. Okay. Nah, not necessary. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, it's going to take a second to find out. Yeah, I know, but I'm trying to get him. Uh, oh, okay. Is there a mute off? Well, yeah, there is, but we, we were. Just bear with me for a second here, please. Go ahead and keep presenting. Can you move the next slide while you're yeah. multitask? Yep, that's fine. <laughs> If, if if it goes here, yeah, or shades. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So this is the slide I showed earlier. Um, and when we get down to this local level, I just want to reintroduce it. So global, federal, state, local, and a lot of the programs that get launched go through local governments. It's kind of where the, the tires meet the road, and that where you engage businesses and utilities and other stakeholders with the community. And with volunteer groups and subject matter experts. Um, this is kind of, in my mind, the legislators, the policymakers have kind of done their thing. They've done what they can. They're just, they've pumped literally billions of dollars, as I've been saying, into making things happen. Now it's up to this lower level, people like us, to participate. So, thank you. Next one. Yeah, so I'm going to let Paul wrap up here. Yes. Um, so what is it that you can do? The key thing is if you're interested in some of these programs, look up the, uh, the, the things that the activities that you need to do to actually sign up to do some of them. The Illinois Solar for All, there's a series of uh, contacts for uh, rooftop installers. There's, uh, 
link here. It's a little bit hard to see. It's a common comment on smart energy for how the solar rock works. Um, if you're interested in doing a group by Citizens Utility Board Hub is a very good resource as it is for community solar. And um, this last one here, the community driven community solar, this is something that's still in process. Uh, so we have to wait until mañana to get more information on that. Uh, and then this link here, again, these are hard to see perhaps on the screens, but when when this is posted, I think they should post it. Yeah, we do, we yeah, do, right. we do. You'll be able to see it more clearly. And the one other thing that I wanted to add, when Tim was going through um, some of the community agreements, reaching contacts and so forth, the Soul Smart is a very relevant thing. I mean, for those of us who live in Arlington Heights, uh, and Arlington Heights has a reputation with the solar installers for being solar dumb. They're making the permitting process unnecessarily convoluted. So SolSmart is a very good program uh, to get the municipalities to sign on to. So I'm just going to second uh, that one. I think this next one is Tim's. I, I do want to add a little bit of information on the community driven community solar. So when community solar was originally envisioned, you know, I, I was involved in some of the legislation back in 2014, 2016, and it was like, we should be able to put solar in our community. So that doesn't sound like the name. Well, it ended up being such big amounts of solar. All these big companies need all this real estate. So they took all the What's really uh, justified is our, where these solar renewable energy credits come from. The state provides X number of dollars per year for solar for SREP. Basically, community solar got consumed by these big companies and they put them out in these big firms. Community driven community solar is a carve out which says we can now put them in the community. So you may have a park or a public works building or any other facility where you want to actually put it inside the community with a smaller amount of energy, maybe 200 or 300, 400 kilowatts instead of two or five megawatts of community solar. And the, diff the other thing is community solar, as Paul explained, you basically sell your electrons or offer your electrons to the community solar developer. With community driven community solar, you can actually be an equity owner in the project. So you can uh, you actually are now owner of a solar farm that sits on top of City Hall or whatever, and you will get the revenues like you would if you owned a home or whatever. So it's a different program. They're working on the details and hope to see what it is. So it's kind of exciting. Um, so same kind of thing. So uh, just and also all these links were in the earlier slides. We just sort of grouped them here. Like uh, I'm at energy efficiency. Here's where I go. I'm interested in transportation. Things like station, here's where I go. So you can still use other ones the same way. Like, try to put them all in one convenient place. Um, that's it. Okay, um, I'm going to stop the sharing. And uh, Thank you, baby. we'll uh, let me get up there real quick. Um, we got you there. I'm going to go and get my uh, thing moving here because I'm going to take over for just a minute. Stay right where you're at. You can find your burger, please. Go ahead and get yourself some, some uh, go ahead and get yourself some dinner. All right, guys, I'm gonna, now we're gonna take our infamous question and answer period. And if you're online or here at the, here at the college, we'll take you. We're gonna ask you that you please use the microphone for the question so that everybody online can hear. And I don't know what happened to my mic over there. I'm the phone. But uh, we'll get the first questioner here and uh, we'll get you guys on under your chair. Uh, yeah, well, let's Tell us about um, Hang on. wireless recharging, especially when you're going to have a station that's going to get between 50 miles and something like that. Yeah. Go ahead How and does wireless recharging work? Okay. Just, 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 just stand up because I can get you on. Okay. Uh, so the question was basically how does wireless charging work? So, um, so you know how your electric toothbrush works or your cell phone recharger works? The same principle. You have a, a current running around on a, a stationary, in the case of well, below the vehicle, and you have a receiver basically on the vehicle. I have a I have that on my car. 
So I pull in my garage, I park over what they call a parking pad, and I turn it on and it generates a current, which induces a current in the vehicle, which feeds the electric vehicle battery. So um, I also am part owner in a company, a startup company with the dynamic wireless power transfer. So you can do the same thing while you're driving down the road. So that's kind of the next generation of things to come, but, which is really exciting. Right now, the the state they call what I was described earlier is the static, so you can park to each other. Okay. Uh, anybody here next? I'll, okay, I'll get the get the microphone. You want to get on? Stand at the mic. And then we'll get on. We'll get our questions online next. The question is, uh, why can't they go vertical with these some 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 panels? Why is it always going to be around the ground? Can't they? Is there any efficiency to go from go on a building or? Um, the, the solar panels, the best position is to be perpendicular to the sun's rays. That's when you get the best amount of sun. So, you, you well, it depends, it depends on the building. If you have a south facing building in certain latitudes, you probably could do vertical. You might want to tilt them out a little. Um, you can change that angle. So, we live in the 42nd latitude. So, the perfect angle from ground is 42 degrees. So the weather is 20 degrees, so it's a little bit less. You can do it. It doesn't, you know, it's just a question of the best amount of sun is if you're perpendicular. I'm a little off. So vertical would be maybe a lot of this. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, but actually there are buildings that have panels on the side of the building. But they will be have an angle to them so they can get the sun. All right, let him, Andy use the mic. Question is if you don't have a proper angle, say you got 20. Move out of the camera. You don't have a proper angle. Yeah, we got it. We got it. Why not put up a couple more panels to add current to the system? Yes. So that's my understanding. Okay. All right. Uh, how do you want to answer that? Go ahead. Well, the, so the question is um, could you put up panels kind of on any surface and get some energy from them? Um, and the answer is yes. But um, let's just take the example. So I mentioned I have an east facing roof with a 20 degree angle. If I had a south facing roof with a 42 degree angle, I probably would get 30 or 40 percent more electricity. So just to kind of put it in perspective, they have some solar arrays that actually move, they, they follow the sun, the trackers, but and they end up, they might get another 10 or 15 percent, but you got to spend as much on that as you do on the panel. So it boils down to economics. Um, and so most people will try and do that optimization. Solar panels in 2010 were residential, were like $7 per watt. They're now at $3 a watt. So your point becomes more important or more relevant over time as they drive down the car. It's still, you know, if you charge solar installer, they'll put them up. But I, I think you still want to have a, a, a good collection, you know, for your system. Plus, a building, a home, only has so much roof space to get. And if you don't have it at a good angle, you may not be able to get enough energy to cover the home. So, yeah. Okay, let's go online now. Dan, you got a question? Go ahead. Dan, if you uh, Yeah, I got a question. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Dan. I got you. I, you got on mute again. I'm sorry. I muted you by mistake. Okay, this is. A question for the speaker. Uh, this is a democratic state. Do Republican governors also, are they, in, are Republican states also in the solar business or not? That's my question. Um, that's, that's a political question. Um, the answer is yes, but not exclusively. You know, it is a political football in some states. Some Republican states fully support it. Others are fighting it. That's the best they can do. Okay. 
Okay. okay. Who's okay, uh, thank you. okay, Charlie, you'll go next. Just let Charlie go next. Charlie, you're online. Go next, Charlie. All right. All right. Um, do you know if many employers are providing charging stations as a benefit of employment in, in the parking lot uh, of employees at installations? Um, I'll say it's a growing uh, market. Um, I'm actually involved with this, uh, the Clay Cities Group, the U.S. Department of Energy is making a big push. It's called the Empower Program. They're, they're specifically targeting workforce charging. And, and that doesn't mean charging uh, fleet vehicles for a business. It means for the uh, employee. And right now, there, there are some incentives that would support that. I think there may be more to follow. But clearly, you know, people who live in apartments or you know, don't have access to home EV charging, Having to work is is the only reason or the only way you would buy an EV, perhaps. So there's a big push on. There are some of the big companies, you know, Fortune 500 types, they're doing it. Um, we're trying to get it to, you know, the the smaller businesses, and uh, it's not here yet, but I believe it's coming. All right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if you're talking about putting panels. Warehouses, would think would be both the square footage for So the, uh, the question is, um, I guess, using roof space. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of facilities there's no trees, it's a flat roof. Um, you know, your question maybe is what's going on there. Um, it's happening. Um, if you look around the country and in Illinois, and especially with the new incentive procedure, um, that's a growing market. You can, so I mentioned the community-driven community solar, that's a good application. Um, the incentives are here. Um, the investments make sense because they can um, they can use that power to drive their business or their factory or the warehouse. So it is, there are good, some good examples uh, in Illinois um, there's some retailers that are doing it. There's some businesses that are doing it. And again, it's a, a growing trend. We're only at, in Illinois, maybe 1% of our energy is generated by solar. By 2040, we're supposed to be at 50%. So that's going to be a good place for solar. Um, yes. The, the key answer to your question is yes. So businesses that have large flat roofs, Walmart or something like that is a perfect location for this. That is, that is one of the components of the one, one of the slides of the large solar installation for those commercial facilities. But they just have all the square footage. Yeah. Perfect right. spot. And they can get some of the benefits just as well. And yes, they can generate a lot of electrons up there on those big commercial flat roofs. Right. Um, one of the other areas I should say that are by a lot of the church that I'm a member of, but some of the other churches are also doing this. Uh, one of the good things in the federal bill is that they have a subsidy that is parallel to what you would do if you were uh, an individual tax paying homeowner, but since churches are C3, 501c3 organizations, they don't pay taxes, right? Um, now, there are convoluted ways that churches can do this, and some of the churches in our have done this, where you put together a, a group of 10 or 15 or 20 uh, parishioners who invest in the solar installation, they get federal tax credits and it actually becomes a very efficient way to do it for the churches. But yes, the large facilities that have the big groups are excellent places to put. All right. Um, Jen, don't worry about it. I got you right on camera here since you're live. Go ahead and ask your, ask your question here. Well, okay, Richard, you want to go next? Okay. Radio, just a quick question for you. Um, I got, I went, I've had my solar system for about 10 years now, and the technology has moved on quite a long way since then. So my solar cells only produce 240 watts or something like that. Uh, if I want to go back and replace the whole lot with a modern system, would I be still entitled to get a um, 
yeah, the federal and, and state tax credits? Uh, I don't see why not. I, I mean, you'd basically be taking down the old one and putting up new. Would you keep your inverter and all your condo wiring? Uh, the inverter is only good enough. Uh, they're on each cell, so they're only good enough for the old cells, the 240 watt ones. I had to replace the, the inverters and the racks and the whole lot, basically. It's like starting over again. I might be able to use the old wiring down to the panels, but that's about all. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. It's a new system. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Don't forget to put the new roof on. All right. <laughs> All right, Jan, you're next. Go ahead. Can I share my screen, please? Uh, yeah, yeah no, just a second here, okay? Yeah, go ahead and use your share screen function, Jan. At the bottom. Okay. Go ahead and, and then bring it in. We got it. I just happened to download this. I think yesterday or this morning. And um, the, this is a graph from our, uh, hmm, our world in data. Oh, it's from our world in data.org. And um, the red line shows the price of electricity and solar declined 89% in 10 years, 2009 to 2019. And um, the other interesting one, as far as I'm concerned, is this blue line, which is onshore wind. And that one went from uh, 135 per unit here in the It's all right, Jan. We can uh, let that slide. Yeah, yeah. Could you could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it. Uh, Jake, don't worry about it. She was just giving a statement. Okay, Jake. Oh, okay. You your hand up. You got a question? Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. My question is if 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 the whole uh, if if the majority of cars, uh, by, by say 2040, 2030 or twenty forty, the majority of the cars. Are electrified. Uh, what will that do to what? The, what will that do to our electric rates? So, um, the concept I mentioned earlier is the beneficial electrification. Um, in theory, the goal is that we will have a period of time between now and then where we're spending money to get to where we want to be. So, let's say 2040, putting in new transmission lines putting in what they call distributed energy resources.
resources so that we'll have these community solar projects that where the power is generated close to the use. And you know, in a perfect world, everybody has solar on the roof and batteries in their basement or in the garage. You don't need power plants. You don't need to pay the use because you're generating your own electricity. That's a vision down the road, but that's the direction it wants to head. The other thing is if you can exchange um, the electrons in your car battery with the grid, you can actually sell those electrons during peak periods. So you can be selling um, electrons from your car's battery for 20, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, and you're paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So again, that's going to be a whole new marketplace run by smart technology. But the goal is over time to find, if you will, an ecosystem that's going to reduce the cost. And at the same time, we're going to have no more coal, no more natural gas power plants. We won't be paying as much for a centralized utility because it's going to be distributed power. That's the vision. That's the goal. It ain't easy, but uh, that's where I think we're heading. And ultimately, it should reduce costs. Okay, uh, Charlie, you've got the next question. Go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, please let me give me a chance to log on. All right. Does it in engineering? There's a car, the car in design engineering. There's a concept called economy of function. Now, instead of having dozens and dozens of individual solar installations. Isn't it according to the principles of design engineering preferable to have one large installation such as solar or by municipal electricity and infinitely more efficient? I mean, there are resources used to, uh, to make solar equipment, the infrastructure, Plus, we're investing portions of our economy, but in the long run, isn't it preferable to have large solar installations uh, providing this to the homeowner? So um, the answer is, a, I'll say it's qualified, yes. Yeah. So in the infrastructure bill, money is gonna go through what you're talking about, utility scale solar and wind. We're trying to build that up. And that is, in truth, when we talk about getting to the renewable energy future of 40 or 50%, that's the lion's share, you know, centralized renewable energy plan. At the same time, um, when you trans transmit energy from there to the point of use, you lose energy doing transmission. Um, so there's an inefficiency versus you put it on your own roof, you consume it there, it's very efficient. So there's some trade offs. Um, at the end of the day, if you, know, if you have a centralized utility, the fuel is free, but all the wires aren't free, and all the management's not free. So there still will be costs there. Technically, engineering-wise, there's an economy of scale, and I think to your point, Charles. Um, but from the consumer's perspective, the thinking is it will be less to have distributed energy resources and manage things locally. And again, I'm not talking about managing six to 10 kilowatt rooftops, we're going to have, you know, areas like the community solar areas that are, you know, 500,000, uh, 500,000 kilowatts or half a megawatt, up to two megawatts. So we're going to have these large solar farms. Could be a little bit. Um, I don't know if anybody's looked at your specific question. It's a good one. Uh, but the goal is to kind of do an optimization. Yeah, I, I, I still go with the almost ownership but uh i i was looking at the cost of community solar is about 50 percent cheaper i'm surprised it's even that high wouldn't it shouldn't that be lower i'm not sure what you're referring to 50 percent the bill went from 109 dollars to 40 some dollars oh, oh, oh on your example so um, residential solar right now is, is for reference is on the order of three dollars, three dollars twenty cents a kilowatt. Utility solar is depending on where you are can be below ninety cents a kilowatt. Um, so 
you know, if, if uh, again, 10 years ago, the numbers were uh, an order of magnitude higher. They haven't come, been coming down as fast as they had been. But yeah, utility scale power is, is much less expensive uh, to build than other scale because of the economy of scale. But then you got to get the power to everybody's home, the businesses, and you got to manage it all. Um, it's going to be all the above solutions is the bottom line. All right, Jen, you're next. Jen, you're, oh, who wants to go next? I'll just, now when it comes to the data mix, part of that mix is going to have to be the natural gas system. When the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, we still need that natural gas. Huh. And we also, I mean, we to get all the carbon free power. Nuclear has to be involved because we're getting most of it from our nuclear. Uh, excellent point. Uh, he's bringing up the fact that, um, as I mentioned, the you know, sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, you don't have power from renewables. Um, you know, that's the energy storage component of, of that. Illinois is 52% nuclear in terms of our power source. Um, CJA is actually, I'll say, tacitly supporting it on the job side because it's such a huge number and Notwithstanding waste or potential for disaster, it is a clean, it doesn't emit. <laughs> so, um, nuclear is going to be around for a while. Nobody's really addressing that, probably till after 2040, in my opinion. As far as natural gas future plants, they would be offset by energy storage largely. <laughs> they want to get rid of, by 2040, the idea is no more natural gas because. Um, because of the you know the pollutants in the greenhouse gas. Okay, uh, Jan, you want to go next? Well, I was going to uh, just I can. Uh, Jan, let this is question period. We'll, we'll get the yeah, rebuttals. I'm to get my, I'm, oh, yeah, here we go. I think I can. I, oops. Okay. It's all right. Okay. I got it. Uh, well. Okay. I should. I have to do it. Jan, we can, can you hear me now? Yeah. We will we'll be able to so, hear you. Let me get Michael, you on camera. Michael, you want me to unmute? No, no, Jan, just ask your question. You're on okay. camera. Uh, I was I, I was um, thinking about uh Gabriel and the situation and the fact that in Illinois we have eleven active nuclear reactors. Um and I had a question about that juxtaposition, and I can't exactly remember your question. Um, when nuclear is so much more expensive than it used to be, and um, it's getting more expensive even as we speak. Um, and oh, I know that there's a there's a book, a new book out by Mark D. Davidson called No Magic Needed, where he explains that we can use renewables for everything. I, I, my question was about the fact that in Illinois we have 11 active nuclear reactors, and there's a picture that is just sobering when you realize that uh, Chicago is really surrounded by them. And I'm just wondering um, if that doesn't figure in whether you really believe that nuclear is going to be necessary. Okay. Let's, uh, okay. Yes. Um, so this one nuclear, yes. nuclear has uh, the advantage of being carbon free and that it's oh, not okay. emitting CO2. But it is very expensive and you have a huge problem of large amounts of long term radioactive waste. Uh, nobody wants to take long term radioactive waste. We've had, had an opportunity to pass on. Um, we have right now the small plant um, right along quad ball uh, from uh, Lake Michigan, which is the water source of the whole metropolitan area. It was the accurate design as it has been sitting there with long term radioactive waste. So nuclear power plants once they're commissioned become long term radioactive waste storage facilities. We don't want one of them next to us. Um, so that's 
that's the that's the, the cons on uh, nuclear. Yes, half of our electrons come from nukes. The reactors don't last forever, and the cost of replacing them would be huge. So it's a lot cheaper for us to get technology and for renewable energy rather than building a new system reactor and figuring out what to do with it. It's another dimension of to, if you talk to anybody at Sierra Club, they absolutely want to do away with all the nuclear power in Illinois and replace mm -hmm. it with renewables. But that's that is a goal. First things first, let's deal with the fossil fuels. But we're worried if the climate issue is, if you will, the priority. After we get renewable energy up and functioning at a utility scale and a distributed scale integrated with uh, energy storage and having a transmission system that's designed to accommodate that, then we can start building in more renewable energy and making that happen and shutting down the nuclear plant. But for now, we're talking about, you know, it's going to take a couple of generations to get there. So they're not prioritizing nuclear today, but it is not forgotten. But, you know, it's a tough or not stretch. Okay, uh, Dan, you got a question? Yeah, I got a question. Go ahead. So I don't know if you, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but um, what's the mineral that they're getting out of Congo and Ukraine, and I think Nevada, uh, that's used for that? lithium. Lithium for what? Lithium, right? Lithium. I mean, there's not enough lithium for millions and millions of cars and trucks like there are for oil and gasoline and fuel, fossil fuels. So, I mean, the, this is a theoretical question, but what is gonna be, what is gonna happen when, um, when fossil fuel and lithium both run out? Well, first of all, just a, a, a reality check on that. Um, I think right now they are getting some from um, Eastern Europe, China has a lot of lithium. There's some African mines, there's some South American mines. Um, lithium is big, big business right now. The United States has one of the biggest reserves in the world, but we're not using it. Our cost of production, because of environmental and OSHA and other things, and it's just how we do things, it's, it's driving the price up. They are currently looking at opening up U.S. lithium mines out west because of the demand that's growing. Um, we may run into a point where that is a supply issue. Right now, we're nowhere near a concern. And I also believe uh, the, the battery science is relative to um, electric vehicles is, is, at, is at its infancy. They are looking at all sorts of new chemicals, smarter ways of doing it. Um, you know, this innovation is, uh, again, this is hopeful, but I, I think, uh, you know, ingenuity is going to find ways of doing this smarter with other materials. Um, so I, it is an issue today. The solution is evident, but I think it will present itself. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Charlie. Yes, uh, Jim, I, Tim, again, please give me this time to log out. All right. Thank you. Um, the college complexes is a political forum, and my question is, is it appropriate for the government of the United States and the state of Illinois to be putting a segment of the industry, the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry, in effect, out of business? And they're using taxpayers' uh, funds and exceeding the amounts in order to determine the pricing and cost of an item. Um, apart from my own sentiments, uh, are you in essence spokesperson for the AOC Green New Deal socialist socialization, socialist transition of our US economy? Was there a question? <laughs> I, I'm not sure what to say. I, I'm here to provide information. I'm not going to get into that fair trap. Oh, 
Jeez. All right, Jake, you got a question? Go ahead. I mute Jake. Hang on, he's got another answer for you. All right, Charlie, go ahead. I mean, all right, go ahead. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my question is, my question is, just, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, this is a follow up to the pre to to my previous question. Um, you 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 phase out all power plants and have everything uh, uh, localized, so everything's on solar by 2040. Um, how how are you how are you gonna run? My question is how how are you gonna run a uh, how are you gonna run a factory that way? Is it going to be enough power? You still if you're uh, producing uh, electric cars and solar solar cells and so forth, you still have to produce them. They don't grow on trees. Yeah, I'll just very briefly answer Charles first, which is, uh, yes, there's a good reason for trying to phase down carbon generating uh, electricity. That's because global warming is a for the planet. That's a simple answer. Uh, so that's why we are trying to decarbonize the electricity. Um, okay. Against the industry say, it's just that we have to decarbonize and actually be a little concerned about the environmental impact of nuclear. Um, so then the second question is yes, you can answer this as well as I, but yes, we're trying to come up with enough renewable energy. Businesses, in many ways, if you've got a good factory, you probably have a very nice roof to put solar panels and do that for cheaper electricity. So, what was that? I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't hear the answer. What? Um, I want to go back to Charles real quick. Sorry about that. Um, the other thing is the coal industry, the natural gas industry, which supports the gas industry, they've been subsidized for 120 years. It's actually legislated into a different laws. So they've received so much more um, through government support over the years. Renewable energy is, is playing catch up. And the Paul's point, the goal is to, you know, Keep the planet where it needs to be. Okay. You got anything else? Okay. Now let's go to. Okay. What we'll do next is go to re. What? All right. I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. Then we'll get you, Jen, one more time. Yeah, no, I've got a question. All right, Charlie. Wait a minute. We got this. Go ahead, Bert. Please. Do you have any expertise on? I won't claim to be an expert. They are doing it. They're doing it, you know, in the, especially in Northern Europe. Um, they're having successes. It's another form of energy recovery from the planet. Um, it's expensive. So right now, that's why we talk about renewable energy, typically solar and wind, because uh, as the lady showed, the prices are, are lower. If you put um, the wave energy on that chart, it would be high. But it's still a good idea. Okay, now, Charlie, you got one more question. Go ahead. Yes, gentlemen, could you tell us about you're affiliated with the Sierra Club? I'd like to know more about the organization specifically in the Chicago area. Do you have meetings? Uh, where do you meet or so forth? How do I join? Uh, how do I get involved further in this apparently worthwhile organization? Yes, uh, it's a very good organization. It's one of the oldest uh, of the environmental organizations. I can go into the uh, Audubon is slightly older, but it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, the Illinois chapter uh, is located at 15 East Lake Street down in the loop. Um, and that Illinois chapter has 
2013, there are about a dozen, a little over a dozen uh, individual groups. Uh, Tim and I are in the Northwest Cook Group, the largest group. You will not be surprised that it's in Chicago, it's some of the suburbs as well as the city of Chicago. But uh, they go down all the way to the Shawnee down in the far southern tip of Illinois is another one of the groups. Local organizations and tell you more about the activities that we have. We have a monthly program um, in the Northwest Cook Group and all these other groups have individual activities. So, um, yeah, right. And many of them are, are entertainment. We first put this program together out in Arlington Heights as a whole town hall meeting with two of uh, very good uh, state senator and state representatives and making these presentations as well. Okay, we're now going to go into rebuttals. No more questions. We're going into rebuttals now. Who's got rebuttals tonight? Let's give. I'm going to give everybody about uh, three to four minutes each. Uh, Jan, if you want to go first, go ahead. I'll get you online here and uh, just take your microphone. And why don't you? Uh, I got you online. Uh, here. I remembered my question that I was stumbling over. I was thinking that if we had a distributed grid, that we would not get into the problems that they're having in the Ukraine because uh, you can't that uh, you can't just wipe out. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then I want to make one comment about lithium. Uh, what's happening with lithium right now, as long as it's essential, is that we're following the way that we've always followed. We go on to uh, indigenous lands, we find lithium, and we kick out the Indians. And this is what's happening in Sacre Pass, Nevada. And um, uh, the, the Indians are being evicted from their, their uh, ancestral lands so that they can dig in and get lithium at Sacre Pass. And right. also, there's a huge lithium deposit in South America uh, on the border of Peru and I think Chile. And that lithium deposit is also uh, indigenous land. And so uh, it looks like the pattern of pushing out uh, indigenous people so that the capitalism can thrive is not, um, it, it's still up there. So now, can I? My go ahead, go ahead, Jen. Okay. So, um, oh, I have to go. Um, you have to do it on. I have to figure out how to do it. Right, none of And that is where um, 
Okay, so that goes with these pinks. Uh, these are the nuclear plants in the United States. And every single one of these nuclear plants now has a lot of radioactive waste. And the government is not finding a deep geologic repository for it. So they're thinking they're going to send this stuff to these places in New Mexico and Texas, which means it would be on the road in every, in, in every, almost every jurisdiction in the United States to get this radioactive waste. And we already have, I think, um, I think it might be my next. Uh, the metric terms of irradiated nuclear fuel as of 2018. Um, and over on the right hand side, it shows that the different amounts of nuclear active waste that is stored in these various states. And uh, you will notice that, well, if you go back to this one and just look at the Illinois, Illinois has more nuclear reactors than any other state in the nation. And so when it comes to the dangers of emissions from nuclear reactors, we're the target. Um, so you can see that we have a lot of, of nuclear waste in our state, Pennsylvania, and okay, I knew some, but I think this is South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, these are the places that have the highest amount of nuclear waste in the state. Um, and before 1982, we were collecting waste at Morris, Illinois. They were sending waste from all over the place to Morris, Illinois, and it's still there. Um, and as far as nuclear power is concerned, there is a picture of the tanks around Fukushima that are filled with radioactive water. And um, this simply belies the idea that, that nuclear power is possibly the Gulf Stream. Um, um, anyway, this is another picture of uh, um, southeastern Mexico and western Texas, and it shows where they're trying to put uh, a CIS stand for uh, centralized interim. Nothing interim about it. Once this gets there, don't have any place else to put it. Um, and this shows the, the, the isotope called TCM 137, which is the, really the most dangerous isotope. Um, according to, uh, okay, Robert Alvarez is the one who developed this graph. And um, he's showing that one canister of waste holds roughly the TCM 137 released in this entire 1986 Nobel reaction. And the different things on the graph are uh, the megatons of nuclear weapons that have cesium-137, the Chernobyl accident, the atmospheric nuclear chest. Uh, SOM is the um, San Onofre nuclear generating station. And uh, then there's the, well, that's SOM 2 and SOM 3, and then the dry cast for SOM. And then I just had one other thing I wanted to share. Uh, if I can find it quickly, I don't know if I can. Um, oh, that's not it. Uh, hang on one little second, and I will find it. Because I have a little list. So, the evidence may feel strange about the whole idea that nuclear power is privately, you know, is crazy. <laughs> it's actually crazy because the evidence in the field chain. Okay, there's ten items: drilling, mining. Okay, all of these things produce carbon dioxide. Drilling, mining, milling, the chemical transformation that takes place in uh, Paducah and reaching across the Illinois, enrichment, which is it's the biggest building in the world during the Cold War were the buildings where they put the um, uh, uh, gas chromatography for enrichment of uranium. 
fabulous amount of construction and an extraordinary amount of energy is used. Fuel fabricators make the fuel that actually goes into the nuclear power plant. Construction of the nuclear power plant. Mark, Mark Jacobson says that the Bobo that's being constructed now has used enough cement to build a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. And this is the construction of a nuclear power plant, and you can't tell me that is carbon free. Uh, okay, and then the construction of spent fuel tools that making these canisters, I've just got many pictures of the canisters. They're like, this is a bigger round, and um, they're concrete. The outside of the concrete and inside is the same. Um, and Five, four to five minutes, but it's been longer than Yeah, okay. okay. But anyway, I, my last, uh, the last number of the tent is the transportation that is associated with all the other lines, and the transportation creates carbon dioxide. Okay. All right, Charlie, you're going to be next three or four minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly respond and you'll say get, you'll get, you'll get, you'll get a rebuttal. No, I don't. I agree with the rebuttal. Okay, it's not a rebuttal. All right, let's uh, let's get into our uh, Charlie. You're next, Jan. If you can uh, All right, let's restore order. Uh, first of all, let me. Are we done? Please keep quiet, folks. Go ahead. We'll mute here while you go your three or four minutes. Uh, well, mute, and then I'll begin. Uh, first of all, let me thank Paul and Tim on behalf of the college and the Sierra Club uh, for their very uh, detailed presentation and information regarding. Uh, oh, there goes my car. Oops. <laughs> Don't you love it? It's not me. Oh, it is me. Are we okay? All right, again, thank the Sierra Club for a detailed uh, presentation regarding uh, alternative energy, clean energy. I uh, just have a few brief comments to make, perhaps in rebuttal to the inane question that I heard from Russ and, and um, Jake and in rebuttal to Tim on occasion there, the question was um, regarding uh, the intermittent supply of energy uh, by solar or wind. We've heard this inane uh, assertion made and by some others, none other than a guy who was the president of the United States, unfortunately. Um, the essence of the program uh, is to preclude, there are two ways that intermittent production of energy can be precluded. One, by industry, that's the thing. You know, if poor industry will not have energy, what are we going to do? Number one, if you're operating a business, and there are examples of this out there, the business goes, makes efforts of their own initiative to provide their own energy. You saw this in, in certain entrepreneurs like Henry Ford. He had his own railroad and things like that. He had vertical, I believe they call it a vertical company in which you, you begin from beginning to end. So it's incumbent, nothing precludes a company from taking a portion of the profits otherwise used by the CEOs for vacations of their family to Disneyland and invest in alternative energy sources for their industry. The other thing that um, can be done uh, is that if with the extensive proliferation of so alternative clean energy sources, it's highly unlikely that, that it's more likely there's going to be a surplus of energy. So I don't know why they were concerned of industry will not have a sufficient amount, but they're going to have a surplus of energy if this program achieves fruition. Most assuredly, we'll have so much energy, we're not going to be certain what to do with it. 
and by 2040. Now, the third thing is, and uh, I'll preclude, there has been some discussion of nuclear energy, which is dead. There's no nuclear reactors being built. And I assure you, they're never going to, we're ever going to see a thorium nuclear reactor in the United States. One reason is thorium nuclear energy simply doesn't exist as a technology. And number two, even if you began constructing a thorium reactor today or on Monday morning, it would take 10 to 15 years, even for the first day to turn it on experimentally. And by then the economy will have easily transitioned because of such forcing fighting legislation such as CJA. So unfortunately, you didn't get your act together in time to have any effect on this matter. Anyhow, thanks a lot, gentlemen. I appreciate the work you put in time and effort in your PowerPoint presentation and look forward on having you visit the college again for an update on progress in this regard. Thank you. By the way, would either one of you or Tim please forward a copy of the PowerPoint presentation on OneDrive that I can download and I can uh, post in our uh, free film uh, library. Thank you. Justin's gonna, gonna go real quick while I uh, do a quick rebuttal here myself. All right. I'm gonna lower, lower that a little more, bring me in a little better yeah. here. Okay. The first thing I'm gonna tell all of you guys about nuclear. We are doing nuclear wrong right now with the light water reactor. What we need is not a continuation of the present dilemma of our light water reactors. We have something called a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which is based on a liquid principle that makes virtually nuclear power safe. And the thing is, renewables are not going to produce enough energy to produce a mass industrialized world. We're still going to need large scale centralized power for the powering of an advanced industrial society. The way we do an advanced industrial society is we innovate. One of the reasons why nuclear is so expensive is because of a lot of because the reason why we have a lot of nuclear waste is we don't recycle. They do in France, and the total volume of nuclear waste around the world is about a football field with about 25 feet high of long-term waste. Now, a lot of that could be burned off in advanced reactors that are being right now made. China right now has just opened up in the last, and as of last uh, September, started a prototype project of a liquid fluoride thorium reactor and so far been successful. And so far, it's been running at, at a thing. What the thing is, is that when you get into an advanced type of liquid fluoride thorium reactor, it uses a technology called molten salts, which means when the reactor, you have to keep the reactor going instead of trying to keep it out of control and keep it down instead of running away like they do in a conventional plant. The reason why conventional plants are so expensive is because we use water as a coolant under about a thousand PSI. And if we could go to a, a one that operates at atmospheric pressure, which these liquid fluoride thorium reactors do, it's there. Now, if you don't believe me, take a look at the Thorium Energy Alliance. And particularly, there's another link called the Roadmap to Nowhere, where Mark C. Jacobson has thoroughly been debunked because to power the entire United States on solar power and wind power, first off, it's going to cost a lot more than it would if we got the country with uh, these molten salt reactors. Second, the amount of land area would take up the entire state of Arizona covered in solar panels. And plus, these solar panels have to be replaced every 80 years or so to uh, keep us going. And plus, with a large scale wind installation, it's just like putting a 50 foot skyscraper in a forest. Now, the thing that you got to remember is this, if you want power, it's much better off to use it. Now, they've been talking about fusion power. It's still a ways away. It might be something to consider, but it's still way off. 
the uh, the, the uh, loop leader case with Thorium and some of the uh, with what I've looked at over the last you know 30 years or so. I got introduced into this about 2008, and I was flabbergasted that these guys are absolutely crazy. And as far as the NEIS is concerned, we've seen a lot of lies tonight about, you know, I'm not going to disagree with the uh, nuclear waste or the storage of nuclear waste, but a lot of that is because there's still about a 97% chance of usable nuclear fuel in that stuff. And if they recycled it, it would be a lot better off uh, using it, reusing it again. And it's, it, it, but you know what the biggest, you know what the biggest reduction in nuclear weapons was? Was the megatons to megawatts program where it took up spent uh, nuclear warheads, downgraded it, and they used it in reactor. That's one of the reasons why uranium is cheap now. Now, as far as mining of uh, thorium and other rare earth metals, thorium is a waste product of, of, of rare, rare earths. That's exactly what we need for electric cars. And there's been bills in Congress to have what they call a thorium bank, where they wouldn't take any taxpayer dollars to us. There's a lot I'm covering tonight, but I'm just going to ask you to look at two websites, the Roadmap to Nowhere and the Thorium Energy Alliance website called the Thorium Energy Alliance. It's a local organization based out of here in Harvard. There's a guy by the name of John Kutch who does a lot of this stuff. And uh, if you believe the lies about nuclear power, it is still one of the most safest forms of energy around. If you look at best per kilowatt, there has been a lot less with nuclear energy as far as Chernobyl and some of these big time disasters are. Radiation is really not that much, and it's a lot less than background. So, do they really use nuclear bombs to power <laughs> reactors? They use nuclear bombs. Nuclear, nuclear bombs. Are you saying it's safe? Charlie, the warheads and nuclear bombs are prime material for nuclear reactors. All you got to do is take those warheads, downgrade a little bit more, and you got good fuel for nuclear power. Are you for real? That's right, for real, Charlie. Charlie. What's that, Charlie? I'll just I'll end with this. Thorium, thorium, molten salt reactors. Oh, tremendous possibility for humanity. What's that? What's he nuts? It's a real show. Oh. I missed a good chunk of the uh, presentation, but it sounded very interesting to what I heard. Yeah, it was. Um, I, uh, you know, I think people should try whatever methods they want to uh, for energy, um, as long as you don't ask people. To um, I don't. Maybe one day that solar and wind will be very, very effective. As of now, it's not. Um, but uh, I. I, uh, I find it very interesting though, that, uh, that uh, people can uh, claim to you know support socialism and you know, free this, free that. Uh, but for whatever reason, I just had to pay tuition here at the college. So it, it's, there's, there's not a lot of intellectual uh, consistency going on here. Uh, with how this club operates and how the uh, the the operators of the club wish to impose their worldview on others. So, um, um, so yeah. Um, but uh, hopefully, in the future, wind and solar can be more effective. Hopefully, in the future, uh, nuclear can be less um, dangerous and, and and whatnot. I'm yeah. After the uh, earthquakes there in Japan, it seemed kind of like, eh, um, you know, maybe you know. But Tim, if you're telling me you know what you're saying is is true, hopefully there's a future there for mm -hmm. for for nuclear. But I I you know I still want to see more. Uh, oh, you want to see more proof? Yeah, uh, proof of concept and investments. Also, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know. Um, 
you know, there's rules here, uh, you know, like one pull at a time and stuff. And uh, these rules are, are very, very um, laxly enforced. And when somebody does try to enforce them, I get pushback from, from others. And it seems kind of silly. This has nothing to do with the topic. Charlie, shut up. I'm talk. No, I'm not. It has nothing to do with talking energy. Over here You're not running running the college from the podium. Both you guys are over the age of 30 and both think socialism is a cool thing. So uh, I, I question your guys' perceptions of reality. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, Charlie, Charlie wants everybody to, uh, you know, be raised cradle to grave, but I still have to pay tuition to the college seems very hypocritical to me. No, it's um, not. If you Come want to education, that's the best you can do. Charging people uh, to, you know, gain knowledge sounds kind of against uh, Charlie's socialist principles. Uh, so maybe he's a phony. He's a personal attack. Personal it, attack. It, Sit down. Let him finish, Charlie. And, uh, you know, I, yeah, you're the chair. That's a personal attack. He's, he's, I don't know what he does with the tuition money. I don't know if he pockets it. No. It's or, a, what does this have to do with energy? It's a free speech forum, Charlie. On a, no, it's, uh, this is all a waste of time. See, like, like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Like, uh, you know, I'm so, I, I can be up here and talk about whatever I want for this period of time, but I keep getting interrupted by the doofus 70 plus year old socialist. Um, who uh, is supposed to maintain, help maintain order, but he breaks his own rules. Um, seems kind of silly. Okay, and Justin, let's keep it. Are you so, gonna maintain the chair? And, uh, you know. Uh, I didn't come here tonight to get told off. See, this is, why do you keep interrupting me? I mean, okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna, we're yeah, gonna. I can stop you from ridiculing me. Okay, uh, Charlie, th th I think Justin, we've got more rebuttals coming and so on, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sit out. All right, I'm gonna mute you, Charlie, so that Andy can speak. Go ahead, Andy. No. Go ahead, Andy. You're gonna, you're gonna mute Charlie now, but not for me? Well, the thing is uh, you, you, you have some good uh, contributions to the... Uh, peanut gallery here and Charlie you, you, you were kind of provoking him anyway so let's go on Andy go ahead yeah uh, a couple of things that weren't mentioned uh, that I fully support everything all the programs that our speakers have to talk about tonight energy efficiency is a big one um, I've given some talks here in the past and I'll, I'll make this offer now anybody wants to debate a set of facts I'll bring in versus your opinion. I'll give you a, hundred, a twenty to one odds on a hundred dollar bill. You put up a five, I'll put up a hundred and see if you can win some money on the information single. Because there are some solid facts that are documented that are not opinion. One of them is there's no future on this planet for nuclear power as it exists. We've already we we have a fusion reactor that's already supplying us. 10,000 times more energy falls on the planet every day than what the human race needs. All we got to do is collect one ten thousandth of the solar energy, and you wouldn't need much else. Also, who here is familiar with the term, the new Wall Street term investment called SWAB, being promoted by Wall Street billionaires? SWAB, SWAB said Tesla is having it on. It's going to change the world. It's a multi hundred trillion dollar program. It's Solar, wind, and battery storage. Swap. They said the cheap batteries that are coming online now, Coca Cola has uh, an installation to back up their factories. They're not, we're hearing people that say, well, maybe solar energy is in the future. It's here now, it's all over the world. And the idea, the very idea that we can produce a, a, and get a next generation nuclear plant online before the ice caps melt is pure fantasy. The ice is melting at both poles. <clears throat> and uh, if you haven't seen the latest report uh, came out this last week, they said we're real close to a tipping point. 
of losing big chunks of ice down in Antarctica. They said if that slides off into the ocean, it's, 100, it's 171 feet of sea level rise by the year 2000. So if we're going to be living on, if we're going to be living on a living planet, we have to face reality. That means not shouting over people with ludicrous fan fantasies that have no basis in reality. Like building their predators. Okay, okay. Let him let him finish. The nuclear power industry, for those of you who didn't know it, when they were planning in 1967, they had they they planned for 1,600 reactors on American soil. They thought we would absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange for cheap electricity. That's back there in the archives. That's why John Goffman and a whole bunch of other nuclear scientists, they quit their jobs and went on a campaign trail and they nipped it in the bud. And we got slightly over 100 reactors rather than 1,600. But they knew what they were talking about. One, act, one reactor accident at Chernobyl for every thousand years was a sign. Daniel Ellsberg has just written a new book called uh, The Doomsday Machine about our whole nuclear program. I highly recommend all of you to get a copy and read it. A couple other points. Ten times ten times ten. Bigger to bigger ten. If you want new energy, you can get the, uh, the amount of energy a nuclear plant puts out. You can get the amount of energy for an average nuke putting up solar panels and wind machines. It will cost one tenth of the construction cost to be built in one tenth the time. And give you ten times more energy per dollar than what a nuclear plant would put out. There's there's no there's just no basis for nuclear power to compete with solar, wind, and battery to battery storage. And uh, they're talking about distributed. Well, one last point. If you have <clears throat> central power plants, big concentrated plants, they're like a Trojan horse for terrorists. They're just claiming that uh, you can take out a third of the United States by crippling one of those things in the middle of the night, where you have tens of thousands of distributed solar farms, community farms all over the world, like that one that's a few miles north of uh, Florida. What's what's the one that survived uh, Bannockburn? Uh, um, Babcock Ranch. Babcock Ranch is a, a people came after the hurricane moved into Florida and they came over to Babcock Ranch to get supplies and everything because they're they're a total solar community. And the other thing is, one final note I'll make. We have, nobody's talking about it really, but we have a problem with welfare in America. Right now we're running the greatest welfare program on the planet, and that's welfare for billionaires. We're shoveling money to billionaire predators who have been advertising and controlling the media now for 40 years. That the lawyers for Edison testified in 1985 that the sun doesn't shine in Chicago, so solar energy can't be used here. And uh, the sun doesn't shine in Chicago, the wind doesn't blow in Baltimore, Long Island's not an island. The billionaire predators put this out and they, they control they control the media. Okay. And if we don't deal with that and help people learn where the good information is, then you keep having people living under the illusions that, oh, well, we have to keep using nukes for the next 20 years because solar and wind are away in the future. When in reality, a report came out last week, it was on Common Dreams, it said solar and wind power by 2025 are expected to produce more energy in America than all the nukes and coal plants. Picture that. Okay. That's how fast solar and wind are growing. Did you, you know, is that in line with what you guys are hearing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I so I should have said a common dream. The future, the future belongs to solar, wind power, and battery backup and energy efficiency of all kinds. This is the 44th year, incidentally, of houses in Chamber with no furnace at eight for 10 bucks a month. They've been here for 44 years, but how many people know about it? You spend the furnace money on the walls and windows, you can eat the house at a 1500 square foot house, can be heated with a toaster or air dryer. 3000 square foot house. You're going to need a toaster and a hair dryer, the way the Germans put it. One watt per square foot of living space, a few square meters on the roof will handle the energy needs of a properly built house. 
And that yeah. technology has been around. Buckminster Fuller said we get as much change every five years as we got in the previous 50. Things are going up on an exponential curve. Okay. So uh, log, uh, the last two, two good sources of information that weren't mentioned tonight. That one of them is Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado, rmi.org. The other one is the Yale Climate Connection from Yale University. Both of them have daily, weekly updates of good things happening all over the country and all over the world. Okay? Okay. Now you guys go drink. Okay, Charlie. What were we going to say? I just wanted to say that on this nuclear thing, our program in Northwest Cook last week was a debate between the two sides on the nuclear issue. Is it on Zoom? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah. Look at it. All right. I have an announcement, Tim. Go ahead, you. Charlie, give your announcement. Yes, the College of Complexes was contacted by the One Earth Film Festival that is starting, will be, that's the One Earth Film Festival. You can find it online, O-N-E, One Earth Film Festival. It will be running March 3rd through the 12th, both in-person screenings and online. So if you're interested in ecological topics such as this, uh, we I encourage you to check them out. One Earth Film Festival. Uh, thank you. Okay. You uh, go ahead, Jan. Go ahead and make your announcement real quick. Just stay right there and you can go ahead. Oh, uh, he'll go give the hand it to you. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Um, the program that the gentleman just mentioned uh, was by um, Dave Kraft, who is uh, the head of the group that I belong to, Nuclear Energy Information Service, and I'm hoping that it is recorded, and it, uh, this is the Northwest Cook chapter of the um, group, the Northwestern Cook group of the Sierra Club, of the uh, Chicago Sierra Club, or the Illinois Sierra Club, the Northwest Cook Group of the Illinois Chapter of the National Sierra Club. And um, the Nuclear Energy Information Service is having its monthly um, Night with the Experts this coming Thursday, 7 p.m. And our speaker is going to be Albert Carvelas. And the subject is going to be uh, carbon capture in Southern Illinois at the Prairie State Coal Burning Power Plant, where they have uh, put in a carbon capture contraction, and um, and from uh, and, and and there's a sub a sub subject of carbon um, carbon dioxide pipelines. So this is going to be a very, very interesting, especially for Illinois. All right, let's get this guy. Final rebuttals, you guys get the last word. Go ahead, just hand on the mic, and now I'll get the cameras on. And I'd like to go over this. Well, the thing, the thing is, is that we're out of time now, so. Charlie went on too long. No, 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 come on. You, you can stay. That's all right. Go ahead. Go your. I don't here. know if this is the rebuttal, first of all. Thank you, you Charlie. You did the last word. Yeah. You could rebut us, so you could. Um, it as and, you and thank you all for for quite a lively conversation. I wasn't quite sure that we were getting into this. <laughs> next time I'll be uh, maybe a little more uh, interested in getting into the thick of it. Um, but the message that I think I want to leave, I all would agree, is we're at a point now where there's possibility, whether it's socialism or not. We're good. We have pathways to resolve the climate issue. We need to be thinking about how we as individuals and groups, or where you work, uh, where you go to church, what can you do? What can you do to participate in this and start being, uh, playing a role? Because it's, it's, I've been asked this a few times. We have, whatever, $370 billion being thrown at climate change by the federal government. What if we don't spend it? What if nobody wants to do it? It's up to people to do it. It's up to people like us and people you know. So, you know, talk to people. Tell them that these programs are out there. Take advantage of them. And, and thank you. Okay.
Okay, and then you get you get through your five minutes. I'm just going to second that and say um, you did that. Can I both have solar panels on our house? I'm happy to plan about it. And the subsidies, they get a really, really good deal. So okay. save money, save the planet at the same time. Okay. okay. All right. At this point, I'm going to adjourn it. At this point, we're going to. Oopsies, I'm going to flip over the, oh, make Charlie the host so he can uh, continue the discussion on Zoom. And we're going to log off tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, the college is adjourned until next week. And we'll see you guys soon.